So uh, verse number 10 and 11 is where we focused our time last week. Esther had not shown her people nor her kindred, for Mordecai had charged her that she should not show it. And Mordecai walked every day before the court of the women's house to know how Esther did and what should become of her. And so last week we considered the Lord's direction in our lives when it comes to confessing Him. Um, and when I began that, that portion of Scripture, if you remember, I read some verses that talked about uh, those that are ashamed of Him, He will be ashamed of them at His coming. Those that confess Him, He will also confess before His Father. And those that do not confess Him, He will not confess. And so we studied uh, verse number 10 there with that in mind. Uh, we didn't want to give anybody any excuse to be ashamed of the Lord. That's not what this text was about. It simply is about us following the leadership of the Spirit of God and walking by faith as we confess Him before men. And so we see that the goal here was not that Esther should never reveal her people, but that she should should reveal her people at the appropriate time under the instruction of Mordecai who is a representative of Jesus Christ and so when it came at the appropriate time it was time for the seed to be planted and uh, and the heart was made ready and we see all that God accomplished through that we also saw the Lord's constant care for his own in verse 11 as Mordecai uh, was continually concerned with Esther's welfare and so I want to pick up in verse number 12 this morning. And we read here that uh, now when every maid's turn was come to go in to King Ahasuerus, after that she had been 12 months, according to the manner of the women, for so were the days of their purification accomplished, to wit, six months with oil of myrrh and six months with sweet odors and with other things for the purifying of the women. Then thus came every maiden unto the king. Whatsoever she desired was given her to go with her out of the house of the women unto the king's house. In the evening she went, and on the morrow she returned into the second house of the women to the custody of Sheashgaz, the king's chamberlain, which kept the concubines. She came in unto the king no more, except the king delighted in her, and that she were called by name. Now when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abihel, the son of Mordecai, had taken her for his daughter, uh, was come to go in unto the king. Let me read that again. Now when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abihel, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her for his daughter, was come to go into the king, she required nothing but what he got, the king's chamberlain, the keeper of the women appointed, and Esther obtained favor in the sight of all them that looked upon her. If you remember, we have been considering he guy as a type of the Holy Spirit. So I just want to back up to verse number 12 and consider some of the things in this verse for a moment. Uh, every maid, when it was their turn to go into the king, we find out that before they go into the king, there has been a time of preparation, right? Twelve months they've been made ready. Uh, there have been, uh, the, this purification has taken place. There have been six months with oil of myrrh and then six months with perfumes, with sweet other, uh, odors and other things for the purifying. That comes from the word meaning scouring, so the cleansing of the women. And myrrh, it stood out to me here that myrrh was mentioned in verse number 12. Myrrh is mentioned often in, song, in the Song of Solomon. In fact, when I looked it up, uh, it was by far in the Old Testament mentioned most often in the Song of Solomon. So I wanted to jump over there quickly and uh, just read a few verses here. In Song of Solomon, little book after Ecclesiastes. I want you to see that myrrh is is, uh, and I'm not going to read all the references, it's in here several times, but it's, it's used both in reference to the husband and the wife in the Song of Solomon. And so in chapter 1 and verse number 13, it says, A bundle of myrrh is my well-beloved unto me, as the bride speaks of her beloved. He shall lie all night between, betwixt my breasts. And so uh, myrrh there refers to the husband, uh, to her beloved. In chapter 3 and verse number 6, it says, um, uh, well, verse 5, to know who's talking here, it is uh, the Shulamite, it is the woman. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the rose and by the hinds of the field, that ye stir not up nor awake my love till he please. Who is this that cometh out of the wilderness like pillars of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense, with all powders of the merchant? Behold his bed, which is Solomon's. Uh, and so, again, it's referred to her beloved. The, the reference here is to the husband as application is made concerning myrrh. Uh, but it's not the husband only. We also see it... Uh, attributed to the bride and we find that in verse number 12 of chapter 4 
uh, as uh, the husband speaks, a garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse, a spring shut up, a fountain sealed. Thy plants are an orchard of pomegranates with pleasant fruits, camphor with spikenard, spikenard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon with all trees of frankincense, myrrh and aloes with all the chief spices, a fountain of gardens, a well of living waters and streams from Lebanon. And so myrrh is often referred to them as we consider the love between the, the bride and, and the bridegroom as they uh, it's related to their love and their affection for one another and as they speak of each other in these love terms we see that myrrh is often included and you can look it up it's in there several more times in the Song of Solomon but there is one passage of note that I want to draw your attention to which is in chapter number 5 and in Song of Solomon 5, it's a, it's a familiar passage as, uh, as uh, you know, her beloved comes in, his, uh, his, his locks, uh, the locks of his hair, they're, they're wet uh, with the evening uh, moisture and, and, uh, and he comes and he puts his hand in by the, he calls to her. You remember verse number 2 says that, she says, I sleep but my heart waketh, it is the voice of my beloved. Um, and, and so he's come to her, but she responds in verse 3, she doesn't immediately go and open the door to him. She says, I've put off my coat, how shall I put it on? I have washed my feet, how shall I defile them? My beloved put in his hand by the hole of the door, and my bowels were moved for him. I rose up to open to my beloved, and my hands dropped with what? Myrrh. Myrrh. And my fingers with what? Sweet smelling myrrh upon the handles of the lock. But what happens? I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had withdrawn himself and was gone. The point is this. You can be prepared with the myrrh. She was ready for her beloved, right? The, the odors, the fragrance, the, the spices, the things were there that were appropriate for this time of love. She was prepared with the myrrh, but she still didn't have a heart that was right to receive her beloved. And so we find in our text here in, um, in Esther chapter 2, it wasn't just Esther that's prepared in this manner with the myrrh and, and, and these different perfumes and things to meet the king. All the virgins were prepared with that, right? But just because you have the myrrh, just because you have those outward preparations and that outward show does not uh, confess a heart that is right and ready, to enjoy intimacy with your beloved, a heart that is right towards the king. And so I find, as I read in Esther chapter 2 and in verse number 12, I find a warning here, not just to the religionist, but also to the true believer. Because we see it was the bride whose heart was not ready in Song of Solomon chapter 5. The myrrh was there. The perfume was there. She was ready to receive her beloved, but... Whenever her beloved came, her eyes were heavy with sleep, right? Her eyes were heavy with sleep and her desire for rest and relaxation overrode her zeal for the love of her soul. There's not any problem with the myrrh. Outwardly, everything is prepared for intimacy with her beloved, but she did not wait for him. She did not stir herself. And her heart was not ready to enjoy intimacy with Him when He arrived. She didn't stir herself and keep herself alert until He arrived. And I think about the disciples, right? In Matthew 26, 41, as Jesus is apart from them laboring in prayer, and He's preparing to go to the cross for their soul's sake, and He comes back and every time, what does He find? He finds them asleep. And so this is the word and an instruction not to those outside of the bride, but this is for the bride. What does he say? Watch and pray. Stir yourselves that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but what? You better understand that the flesh is weak, but the flesh is weak. And so we see the weakness of her flesh here as she has not stirred herself and her beloved approaches and she is not prepared and ready. She has that outward show, but she's not prepared inwardly. And when she finally does go to Him, it's too late. She didn't value this opportunity of intimacy with her beloved. And so we know what happens. This time is lost. He is gone. And it will cost her a lot before she finds Him again, won't it? 
There's going to be some pain involved, some struggle and some suffering involved before she finds him again. And so it just stood out to me there that Esther's prepared this way, but so are all the rest of the virgins. You must have a prepared heart to approach the king. Not just that outward preparation. We need purification, not simply of the outward. We need to not be like whited sepulchers that are clean on the outside, but we got to be clean on the inside. And then the outside will be taken care of. And so verse number 13 the way it worked is that every maiden would come, and this is back in Esther 2, every maiden would come in unto the king. And whatever she desired was given her to go with her out of the house of the women unto the king's house. She could have whatever she wants. She could have whatever she chose. And she would go into the king in the evening, and in the morrow she would return, and she would be delivered unto this Sheashgaz, the king's chamberlain. And if the king did not call for her by name, she would never go into the king again. She would be kept under the custody of Sheaz Gaz. Each virgin is given a choice as to how she will approach the king. And it comes down to this singular moment right here. You see that? There's going to be one time that she goes in. And as she goes to approach the king, she's got one opportunity to take what she will before him in the hopes of pleasing him that her name would be called again. Either the king will delight in her now, she will be called by name, or she will never approach him again. You see that in our text? She is first under the care of Hegai. We saw that. We saw him in verse number 8. Uh, it came to pass when the king's commandment and the decree was heard, when many maidens were gathered together unto Shushan, the palace, to the custody of Hegai, that Esther was brought also. They were all under the custody of Hegai. We've seen Hegai as a type of the Spirit of God. But if she's rejected by the king, she is delivered to another keeper, this Sheashgaz, and she is never to approach the king again. She's not associated with Hegai anymore. Now she's associated with Sheashgaz. And I, I want you to see Psalm 51 as David prays to the Lord here. And David understood the danger of this reality that he prayed concerning in Psalm 51. I always go the wrong way. I think Esther is after the Psalms. You need to go to the right to get to Psalm 51. You'd think after spending how long? How many weeks in Esther? I know where it is. Psalm 51, listen to David's prayer here in Psalm 51. This is, this is the prayer after, uh, uh, you know, you probably have a note at the beginning of the psalm that this is when Nathan the prophet came unto him after he'd gone into Bathsheba. He begins crying out for God's mercy. Uh, he begins confessing his sin. Wash me thoroughly, he says in verse 2, I acknowledge my transgression as it was against you only that I sinned, O God. He recognizes and confesses that he was shapen in iniquity, that he was born a sinner, he was conceived as a sinner. He acknowledges in verse number 6 that God is looking for that beauty, for that preparation of the inward man of the heart, and not merely that outward adorning. And so he cries out for that cleansing in verse number 7. And in, in beginning in verse number 9, he says, Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. There's been a time and there's been a season that these virgins are all under the care and under the direction and they've heard instruction from this one that represents the Spirit of God, but there is a time, there is a point coming when they will no longer interface with He Guy any longer. They are delivered to another, to another to be held captive, and they will never see the king from that point on. David is begging God, do not take thy spirit from me. David understands the reality of what you read over there in Hebrews 6, where it says that they tasted of the heavenly gift. They were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, but they are in such a state now that it is impossible to renew them again to repentance. This is a reality. 
This is a very real danger, and David understands it in this psalm here as he begs God for forgiveness and begs that God not cast him away. God, don't let me be an apostate. Do not take your spirit from me, God. Do not place me outside of the influence and the instruction of thy Holy Spirit. David understands this is no small matter. David understands the need is an inward need. And as you hear the gospel call today, as you hear the Spirit of God, which is declaring Jesus Christ to you, to everybody that's here, the gospel is being declared. And it is the Spirit of God that declares the Lord Jesus as the gospel goes forth. As He makes clear the way, as He points you to the way, you do indeed have a choice set before you. Now I understand that that makes us Calvinists nervous. Joshua said, choose you this day who you will serve, right? It's a decision, right? Now we know that the power, the excellency of the power is, God, is of God. But I've told you many times, Peter on the day of Pentecost, when they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? He did not say, you better hope you're elect. He said, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. What will you do when the gospel of Jesus Christ comes to bear upon your soul? When the calling of the Spirit of God is given and He says, this is the way. He is the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but by Him. How will you respond to that? What will you take with you as you approach this King? They had a choice. They had an opportunity to take what they would with them as they approached the King. And you can approach this King in your old way of thinking. You can trust in those old familiar things and you can say, I got this and I know the things that will be pleasing to this king. And come on, come on in that status and in that manner and in that way and come before the king. Because you've made the mistake of thinking that he's altogether such a one as yourself. Yeah, surely he won't care about that. That's not a big deal. I'm basically a good person, right? And haven't we heard men say that? I've tried to do good. When I stand before God, if there is a God, He's going to recognize that. He's basically just like me. I'd recognize that. Will you approach God in that sinful human way of thinking or will you heed the warning of the Spirit? What will you do when this truth has been clearly presented to you by the Spirit of God? Approach Him in that familiar way, the way of your own understanding. I'll be honest with you, any that are outside of Jesus Christ today, they had one time, one specific time that they were coming before the King. One opportunity. This is the day that God is going to call you into judgment concerning that truth that you've heard. One day that they would approach the King. I don't know, you may hear this again next week. I don't know. But I do know this, that there are those that have heard the truth and been recipients of God's mercy over and over and over again. And one day, one day God said, that's enough. I'll show it to you in the Scripture. That was the day that they would come before their king and they were not made ready. How will you approach the king in that hour? We may be right back here next week because God is a God of mercy and you may hear the instruction of the Holy Ghost one more time, but one day you will be called before the king. And I'm not talking about a day of judgment in eternity. I'm talking about a day of judgment right here upon this earth. When God will call you to give an account for the things that you have heard. These women were prepared for a year under the instruction of Hegai. They heard Hegai repeatedly say, this is what you need to do as you come before the king. And one day they were called before the king to display what they had learned from all of that judgment. Peter says in 1 Peter 4, judgment must begin where? 
in the house of the Lord. He's not talking about a day of judgment in eternity. He's talking about right now, right? In 1 Corinthians 11, he says, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. He's talking about right now. And so I'm talking about a day that the Lord calls you into question regarding what you, by His great mercy, have heard as the gospel has gone forth. Look at 2 Thessalonians. I told you I would show you individuals that had heard the truth but had refused it. And so they walk around now blinded forever. They walk around in darkness forever. That day they were to go before the queen, uh, the king they were not made ready. And in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse number 10, it speaks of this one coming after the working of Satan with all deceivableness of unrighteousness and them that perish. Why do they perish? Because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Whose fault is that? Does the language support that? Whose fault is that? It's their own, right? Amen. And so what is the result of this not receiving the love of the truth? Who declares the truth to you? The Spirit of God does. We're going to see that. He's using human vessels, right, to do that through the preaching of the Word of God. Isn't that how salvation comes? Isn't it through the preaching of the Word of God that the Lord draws souls unto Himself? He uses instruments for that, but it's the Spirit of God that Jesus Christ said will testify of me and bring all things to remembrance whatsoever I've said. He will testify of me, Christ said. And so the Spirit of God is declaring the truth, but these would not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And so what is the result when God calls them into question that day? And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. When they left the king that day to be delivered into the custody of Shehaz, Gehaz, whatever his name was, they never saw the king again. Only those that the king called by name. You see where we're going with this? But I, want, I just want to impress upon you this morning the seriousness of hearing the gospel preached. And that every one of these women, they were given opportunity to take what they would. And you're going to see a distinct difference between Esther and all the rest of those virgins in how she approached the king. What will you do with this word that God has given. When this day came, when they would go in before the king, those that did not receive the love of the truth, they would never approach the king again. And they are delivered to the captivity of another that has no interest in preparing their heart to meet the king. That's not Sheash Gaz's job. That was he guy's job to give them the instruction to point them to the king, but not Sheeshgas. When they're delivered unto him, they do not approach the king anymore. Only those called by name. So may we approach the hearing of the word of God with the same seriousness. May we rejoice in the blessing and in the mercy of the instruction of the Holy Ghost as the word of God is declared. We're going to see it very clearly the Holy Ghost is preaching the gospel through His ministers to all the world. And they're accountable for that. When they refuse the Word of God, they are refusing the Holy Ghost. They are resisting the Holy Ghost. They are blaspheming the Holy Ghost when they refuse the one that the Holy Ghost declares. May our hearts be made ready. Any thoughts as we close? David gives you the answer. Where does David go for the preparation of his heart? Create in me a clean heart. Who? Oh God, right? God's the one that makes a new heart. David understood, Lord, you've got to make me right 
on the inside. These sacrifices and offerings, he says in Psalm 51, not pleased with any of that. You want a broken and a contrite heart. That's an inward work that the Lord does. It's the circumcision of the heart that we need, not that circumcision of the outward man. 